Welcome to uh, day two of the Anthropocene Feminism. And uh, I actually had considered another reading this morning, but I think we'll just leave it before we left it. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to uh, introduce Rebecca Sheldon, who will introduce Myra Heard. As I mentioned yesterday, Rebecca was one of the uh, sort of team of folks who was helping to conceptualize the Anthropocene Feminism uh, Conference along with Emily Clark and Celia Hanna and myself. And uh, Rebecca's a former fellow at the Center for 20 yes. and Free Studies. And it's a great colleague to welcome her back. Okay. Thank you. Thank the second day of the Center for 21st Century Studies at the Pacific Foundation Conference. I've been hoping for several years now for the opportunity to bring Meyer Heard to the Center, and this is a particularly felicitous moment to have done so. For her work is, I think, exemplary of the transdisciplinary scope that C21 seeks to foster, and that the Anthropocene and feminism demand. Trained as a sociologist in the field of sex and gender studies, she currently teaches and researches as professor of environmental studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She's also the founder and director of the SSHRC-funded Gender Research Project, or group rather, where she works with colleagues from urban planning, geography, geology, engineering, environmental and biomedical sciences on research questions of broad public interest, such as her current project on Canada's waste flows. Prior to her arrival at Queen's, Dr. Hurd spent a year working alongside the microbiologist Lynn Margolis in her labs at UMass Amherst, and from out of which she wrote her, I think, stunning 2009 monograph, Origins of Social Life. She's also the author of Sex, Gender, and Science in 2004, and Sociology of Science in 2011, and the co-editor of 2008's Query the Non-Human, and a special issue of Feminist Theory on Feminism Theorizes the Non-Human, among other collections and special issues. In dozens of articles and book chapters with titles like Animal Trans, Deep Shit, Digesting Difference, and Animal All Too Animal, her work features the profound and sometimes disruptive discoveries to be gleaned from slow intimacies with and careful attentiveness to the extra ideational world. Her fidelity to non-human life worlds, however, is not a rejection of the epistemological, but a drive to thicken our, our habitual conceptualizations with the multifarious manner of inhabiting the world we see at the scale of the very small. Thus, one of the most remarkable sections in Origins of Social Life simply rehearses in the style of the glossary all the ways that microorganisms force us to shift what we mean by sex, gender, and reproduction. Whether she is discussing mixes or phthalates, barnacles or garbage juice, Myra reminds us that if one claims to study, study science, one must at some point actually get dirty. For our best theorists, maybe the ones that are hardest to hear from behind the lectern. And in one form or another, we will all have to learn what she calls a filthy lesson of indifference. I am so pleased that she's here with us this morning to talk about landscapes of terminal capitalism, aporias of responsibility, life worlds inherited, inhabited, and bequeathed. Please join me in welcoming Myra Hurd. So I am uh, really glad. <laughs> I, I, so I'm, this is all to say that I, 
I think we do a far better job explaining to this table in this talk than I did to that customs guy, who actually, I didn't tell you this, Emily, but he actually said, why couldn't you be going to a makeup convention? A cosmetic convention. And I, I was going to say, well, you might have, you know, this, let me talk about this word feminism, but then I, I, I just wanted to get through. So I think, you know, you never have to take this right off. So, um, all right, so I have a number of thank yous before I get started, right? I need to thank the center very much for um, inviting me here. I'd like to thank Richard, of course, Emily, and Nat, who have been wonderful, and John at the back there, who has rigged me up so that I can, I can walk and, and move around. Thank you all very much for your real generosity. Emily keeps magically showing up with her car and driving me places. It's, it's just, I don't know what I'm going to be bereft when I get back home and we're not there, you know. Um, and I, ha I also have to thank uh, SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, who have, for some, I don't know, weird reason, funded me for years, and I could not do what I do without them. So I'm very <coughs> grateful that they, they take a chance on me. Okay, so, by way of introduction, I'm sorry I'm going to be... Uh, yeah, I know. But okay, so as we heard yesterday, I'm going to just rehearse a little bit of this, just to make sure we were all paying attention. Right in 2002, Paul Kretzen's Anthropocene captured an idea that had been circulating for a, a number of years, right, signaling the end of the Holocene and a point uh, at which human activity is intersected in its significance and magnitude with planetary geophysical forces. When exactly we entered this era remains a matter of some dispute. Some say it was during the Neolithic, as we heard yesterday, when forests were cleared for agriculture. Others place the inauguration during the late 17th century, the point at which the Industrial Revolution and um, accelerated extraction and burning of fossil fuels began to take place. This hydrocar uh, hydrocarbon corpse juice, or uh, 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 whatever we want to call it, these fossil fuels, is a form of necro waste, of course, right? Um, made from the mainly uh, anaerobic decomposition of very dead, dead organisms. Until recently, Kretzen had been of the opinion that the anthropocentric time began roughly 200 years ago, but recently he's changed his mind. He now places, quotes, the real start of the Anthropocene on a specific date, July 16, 1945, the Trinity detonation, and its signature, invisible radioactive decay. Once again, waste, this time nuclear, instantiates the Anthropocene. So of course, this is, since I study waste, this is super convenient for me. So whether we're talking about fossil fuels or nuclear, it all comes down to waste. It's, it's extremely inconvenient for humanity, but really convenient for me. So how is waste then inaugurating an epoch, the only epoch that centralizes humans? How has waste as a remainder, a fallout, a waste become the signifying layer, Kretzen's golden spike, that defines our species legacy. I want to draw the two sides of this planetary equation, um, human equation together, in a consideration, surprise, of waste. Whether in the form of mining, nuclear, industrial, hazardous, sewage, mun municipal, whether it's landfilled, incinerated, buried deep under the ground, or uh, as we heard about, a little bit about yesterday, energy from waste. Waste constitutes perhaps the most <coughs> enduring trace of the human, a major human and non-human planetary de- and re-stratification. Waste actualizes a, as a signifying layer in particular ways in Canada, which is going to be the focus of three case studies that I'm going to talk about. A country that is known for its abundant and diverse geological strata, but's less well known for its lavish production and myriad forms of waste. So I'm going to, as I said, focus on three case studies of waste management, which is how waste is always talked about in industry and government. It's always, it's never waste, it's always waste of management. Um, that change the pedosphere, a geosphere, which in turn reworks the biosphere. Each case study exemplifies the simultaneous operation of global political economic practices, characteristic of, characteristic of industrial capitalism, and complex metallurgic, mineral, and biological processes interacting spatially and temporally. The banality of waste management undergirds the politics of the Anthropocene in a particular way. Far from the international concern aroused by climate change, waste rather silently 
and thus the, all the more inauspiciously moves us towards what I call terminal capitalism, a state whereby our only solution for dealing with the toxic uh, and, and contaminated uh, material that our relentless consumption and sanitary depletion generates is by producing permanently temporary waste deposits for imagined futures to resolve. As such, we're not so much leaving behind our waste for some imagined future humanity to decipher our history, as is the focus of the Anthropocene, as we are bequeathing a particular futurity through a present abnegation of projected responsibility. I'll consider waste as a signature of terminal capitalism, capitalism through Isabel Stanger's provocation to reconsider democratic engagement around environmental and other public concerns. Stanger's is wary of all forms of public engagement. Um, she, and she writes, the consensual transformation of the so-called ignorant pub, uh, public master world into the citizen's master world is an empty, great idea. It will not work. As Adrian McKenzie points out, any public that's completely identified and defined by pre-given processes and, and forms falls short of democratic political practice. For Stenger's, any hope that exists is in the form of objection because it, quote, rejects the differentiation of ignorant publics and knowing science. What Stenger's refers to as objecting minorities produce not in their aim but in the very process of their emergence the power to object and to intervene in matters they discover concern them. This is the difference, argues Stenger's, between a public concern with participating and quotes the potentially most interesting possible public of all, of all, an objecting public. The following case studies consider participating publics and their possible op opposite, an objecting public, and indeed, an objecting biogeologic. Okay, case study number one. There's just three, so stay with me. Okay, <laughs> this, is the, this is the one that is, I think, the most familiar, the most boring, and the one that's hardest to pay attention to. So, I apologize. <laughs> because it pretty much, I don't know where you're all living, but it pretty much, this pretty much, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say pretty much describes urban living. If you live in North America, Europe, or the Antipodes, this pretty much describes what's going on. But I'll talk about that. So, Canada is the world's highest per capita municipal solid waste producer. We beat out the U.S. in 2000. We produce the most waste. I know. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we produce well over a ton of waste per person annually, most of which is landfill. And municipalities across the, the country are grappling with landfill saturation. Many municipalities export their waste to uh, other Canadian regions. We export a lot of waste to the U.S and other countries such as Mexico, China, Korea, etc. So my research collaborators and I completed an empirical study of waste governance in a city in uh, Ontario, which is where I work. Our study found that uh, waste management um, here, like in most regions in Canada, is largely a banal, mundane, and highly routinized practice. Indeed, waste management is a particularly robust site of neoliberal governmentality or as Latour would have it, which describes, and I quote Latour, all those institutions that appear on the surface to be absolutely apolitical, and yet in their silent, ordinary, fully routinized ways, they are perversely the most important aspects of what we mean by living together, even though no one raises hell about them. And no one raises hell about waste management. Waste management is largely structured as a matter of responding to individual citizens' waste needs through industry-producing technology, rather than, for instance, as a socio-ethical issue. Training waste management as a technological issue circumscribes discussions to focus on better waste management technology, longer serving landfill liners, better ways of disposing of incinerated fly ash, etc. And diversion, primarily recycling, the latter for which members of the public are largely held responsible. This articulation of governmentality, then, instrumentalizes a particular public in relation to waste, one that conceptualizes waste at the individual level to be resolved with downstream techno-science responses. I took this quote, I, went, I go to all these like industry waste management 
expos where they give amazing goodies. Like honestly, the, the social science and humanities, the goodies we get, like you're lucky if you get a bag, right? Like you should go to these ones. They, they, they give you all kinds of stuff. You know, they have martinis, they honestly. And I, just, I couldn't help. This was above one of them that, you know, I, I got it. You know, they have all of these giant, it's all techno fixes, right? So this is the expos about how, and then, you know, the best products and the worst stuff on earth. You know, that pretty much sums up the way that industry. So these industries operating in tandem with uh, municipal governments increasingly ask members of the public to accede to prescribed assessment exercises to circumscribe the parameters to discussion of what they call end of pipe responses, i.e. disposal. Once this key parameter is set in advance, discussions are further circumscribed to, dis to dis decisions on a limited number of sites, technologies, consultation and discussion events, and consultation timeframes. Multinational corporations specializing in waste technology assessment, siting, construction, operations, monitoring, closure, and aftercare increasingly manage this framing. With on-site engineers and scientists, networks with government, and sophisticated, well-budgeted in-house public relations <coughs> management teams, these new brokers increasingly manage municipal and public discussions of waste management through feasibility reports, town hall meetings, presentations, and other forms of so-called consultation. In consequence, unlike phenomena like climate change that's readily identified with the Anthropocene as constituting, quote, a time of great peril, waste flows in southern Canada are remarkably out of sight and largely out of mind. Geoengineering is the primary discourse through which waste operates. And this geoengineering doesn't garner the same media and public attention as those proposed to mitigate the effects of global warming. <coughs> Working with Stanger's outright rejection of a participating democratically engaged public, Mackenzie points out a public governed by predefined parameters obviates democratic political practice. In the case of, case of waste, then, an objecting public would need to work against the assimilation of public consultation and democratic engagement with waste management. And this is really difficult, for me anyway, to envision, since protests all tend to engage with the assessment exercises set up by government and industry. People don't want incinerators, landfills, uh, waste energy, uh, I mean, I'm not even allowed, according to industry, to say it, incinerators anymore. It's all energy from waste, you know? Uh, they don't, what people are protesting is they don't want that in their area. Not why do we need these in the first place? Do we need these in the first place? Yeah? The up, all the upstream questions. Why do we overconsume? so immensely on this planet, yeah? So, um, for Stangers, an objecting minority would need to refuse the insidious normality of wastes management as such. And as Stangers notes, we'd even find it difficult to see what an objecting public would look like. Protest, for instance, doesn't tend to take the form of the public's rejection of recycling, even though, and you can call me on this, if, you know, the obvious one is to, for us to reject recycling, which is the, quote, dirty little secret of waste management, that most of what we're putting in recycling goes to landfill. Anyway, the stuff that isn't is being carted around this planet using non-renewable fossil fuels. For instance, the styrofoam that Kingstonians very diligently in their middle-class homes put out on the sidewalk is then magically swept away before anyone gets up in the morning. And it goes to a processing plant where then it's shipped to another processing plant where it goes to a third processing plant where it's then taken to a truck, of course, using these, the, the devil shit, as they call fossil fuels, too. Uh, the, the harbor in, in Montreal where it's there put on a tanker and shipped to China where it's dumped in an open, unsealed landfill. So that's recycling. Right? And yet, when I teach courses, I'll go and teach a fourth year course on waste for all my students. It takes me weeks to get them past the, well, I feel really guilty if I put out my pizza thing, you know, and I've left some crusts in there because then I know that it's not going to get recycled. So I try to remember, you know, and I talk to people about waste and bus stops or whatever, and they all tell me about how they diligently try to recycle everything. This is a participating public. This is the great idea that Stangers is saying doesn't work. Yeah? This is waste management in the vast majority of European, North American, etc. This is what's going on. This is certainly the case of what's going on in the south of Canada. Okay. So, 
It's basically techno-scientific fixes plus individual responsibility, right? The recycling citizen. Yeah, which I would say, you know, from Elizabeth's great uh, three or four Foucauldian things, my one would be the recycling citizen is the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so where do we go from here? Well, I think there's somewhere to go. Uh, all right, so case two, objecting politics. This is a, a nice quote. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the north of Canada. So this is, a, I think, a very telling quote, which I'm going to read out because I think it's so good. So this is, uh, uh, was spoken by an Inuit person in Inuit. I always thought as an Inuit kid growing up in an Inuit world that I had my own land. I always thought that. Then one day we were asked to vote for none of it, and then I asked why. They said to me that we're selecting some of our land, some of our land that has to become ours. Pretty much, you know, welcome to Canada. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm doing research in uh, the north of Canada, and I'm studying waste in the north. And one of our case studies is on is looking at waste in Iqaluit, which is the capital of uh, Nunavut. And I'm sure you're not know aware of it, just in case. And so one of the here is in the purple, and I have look at this. Ta-da! This is this is known as like stretching all the way to the very top. The you know the Arctic Circle. I'm not quite sure where it is, but it um, it you know goes around. This is where and this is where everyone is fighting. Russia, the U.S. You name it. it well, this is it's the six countries. So this is where they're all fighting, right? Because this is where the last resources are. Um, and then this is just Canada, and here's Canada here, and there here's none of so none of it takes up quite a lot of the, the north. The Northwest Territories is here, and none of it is, is, is here in the northern part of the um, what we would call Quebec. Okay. None of communities produce little material waste prior to European contact, but are now the largest producers of waste in Canada's territories. Waste didn't emerge as a controversial issue until the early 1990s, when the Nunavut Land Claims Act prioritized the cleanup of waste sites in communities throughout the territory, and as a result, brought attention to hazardous and non-hazardous waste management practices. The Canadian North has become, I would say, the priority of research and resource extraction. In, in Canada, and an increasing number of southern researchers, government and industry representatives, including myself, uh, live in the north on a temporary basis. <coughs> the socioeconomic status of the Iqaluit's transient population contrasts with that of its permanent residents. Inuit have amongst the lowest household incomes in the country, and communities face myriad social issues. Along with being the highest producers of waste, Iqaluit ranks as having the highest rate per capita of smoking in Canada, They've got high levels of diabetes, heart disease, and other diet-related illnesses. Most of the food in Iqaluit's two grocery stores is highly processed, packaged, and very expensive. You know, milk for $24 type of thing. Everything from the south arrives by air or sea, because there's no, there are no roads leading to none of it, as there are for Yellowknife. Yellowknife can be accessed by roads, not, not Iqaluit or anywhere else. You have to fly in, or in the summer, you can ship in. Most Inuit children don't graduate from the town's only high school. Violence against women is a major issue, and the single women's shelter struggles to meet the overwhelming need. Substance abuse is a major problem, and alcohol can only be purchased in restaurants and hotels. Suicide rates are by far the, far the highest in Canada, and some of the highest in the world. Waste is endemic. Oh, this is a picture. When I arrive, when you arrive in it, uh, in uh, Calais, you, and you go to the washroom, the first thing you see are these syphilis posters warning you about uh, the high rates of syphilis uh, in the town. Waste is endemic to Canada's north and proliferates on and in the landscape. The distant early warning or the dew line um, left, uh, which was set up uh, during the Cold War because you know, we we're going to be invaded by Russians, Soviets. Um, um, so, and it left in its wake, wake uh, 63 abandoned sites contaminated with various toxic chemicals that have had to be removed square inch by square inch to the south for treatment. I very, I'm very lucky to work <coughs> with um, Alison Rudder, who is the director of an analytical services unit. She, her team of uh, scientists were put in charge with cleaning up the dew line. She's been up there for the last 20 plus years cleaning this up. And a lot of these sites, it's so contaminated that they have to literally dig up, you know, feet into the ground, all the soil, cart it down to the south of Canada where they try and contain the, the toxicity. So 
So none of it, as in the rest of the north of Canada, is, is by far the most polluted area of, of Canada and some of the most the biggest pollution in the world. Yeah? The numerous military stations littered across the northern landscape also present various waste issues, from abandoned equipment to leaking chemical containers and brownfields. This pales, however, in comparison to the monolithic mining, oil, and gas drilling operations in the north. The sum will pre uh, some predict will constitute a warm war over dwindling resources. A unique assemblage governs Iqaluit's waste landscape. Recent colonial and neocolonial historic, uh, histories, government policies and initiatives, treaty rights, physical geographies, corporate interests, physical and cultural well-being, devolution agreements, climate change, melting permafrost, southern Canadian influence, globalization, socioeconomics, and the material characteris characteristics of waste itself. The city practices open dumping. This is a story that you can't probably see in the photos you took. Um, so this dump is it's impossible not to see it. It's it's huge, and it's uh, they they tell me it's like an iceberg. So two thirds of it is un it's, it's actually underground. They they just dump stuff there because there's a giant ravine. It's right, of course, right by the ocean. All the things kind of into the ocean. So um, there's open dumping. constantly catching on fire. The longest it burned was about 30 <coughs> days and nights, and I went to, I was talking to some of the firefighters and about, about it, and they were saying, you know, it was great for them in terms of overtime, but they feel like they've probably lost a couple of years of their life from breathing in the toxicity. toxicity. So, um, they weren't sure, you know. <laughs> um, and everyone can see the city's enormous dump, which grows across the bay. So, um, the city's open sewage lagoon, Oh, sorry. So here's some abandoned recyclables. No one's actually, no one could actually tell me what's in them, and I think they were the actually so look around. So, but here's a whole bunch of the. Uh, you probably can't even see it. These are barrels of something. Some people told me that they thought it was possibly spent fuel, but they weren't quite sure. Uh, and this is a bunch of metals, etc. So there's no, of course, recycling because it has to be taken out to the south, and it's actually expensive. It's not profitable. Yeah. There's a Here's the sewage lagoon, so they have, all the sewage tanks have to be outside the houses, right? So they, they, so they, and I spent a lot of time with the sewage guy. And they, uh, so they take, drive around, they, they uh, suck up the sewage from people's tanks, and then they drive it out to these the, the giant sewage lagoons uh, here, which is, of course, here's the ocean, and here's the sewage lagoon, and the dump right over here, and so, it sits there and I said, well, what do you do? Because they look pretty, like, high. They look pretty full to me. And I said, what do you do when it gets full? I said, well, you know, we suck a bunch of it up, drive it out to the tundra, and we dump it. So, um, which is what we actually do in the south with the, the sludge from um, water treatment facilities. But anyway. Um, okay, so... Uh, blah, blah, blah. A number of materials, tires, refrigerators, and so on have been collected over time with this idea of tra transporting these, but it's too expensive. Um, contractors, of course, over-order materials since the cost of transporting further material is prohibitive. Unused materials are either abandoned on site or taken to the open dump. There are myriad, um, oh, and I, here's a, here's a, this, this will give you, all of these dots um, are brownfields. So here's the calibit right here. Uh, here's the dump, here's the sewage lagoon, and all of these like dots that you can see, here's um, Apex and, and along here, these are all brownfield sites that have not been cleaned up. Yeah. So there are myriad challenges facing, oh, sorry. There are myriad challenges facing southern uh, uh, practices of waste management in Iqaluit. There, you know, there's a lot of um, territorial legislation, etc., about, about how these, these can be done. And there's particular geo geoengineering that's required. You know, there's 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 no soil, for instance, right? Tundra is really hard to move. There's no trees for after care uh, after care for phytoremediation, and all the equipment to site, build, maintain, and close and provide after care for, for landfills have to be flown in or, or shipped in. Claire Colbert, where's Claire? Oh, your brilliant quote. Her claim that quote, none of the terms of our ethical vocabulary, justice, fairness, respect, forgiveness, hospitality, or virtue, are up to the task. This could not be more apropos with regard to waste in Canada's north. 
These same words repeated in government and industry reports and community meetings to buttress claims of opportunities for growth, exploration, and prosperity, combined with the inexpressible and unaccountable le legacy of colonialism. And so now I'm going to, you know, if I'm not, like, if I'm you know, totally speculating before, now I'm going to do something that I'm super uncomfortable with, because I'm very comfortable, as Rebecca might uh, sort of mention, talk about microbes, but I'm going to now talk about animals, which is far out of my I'm going to talk about birds. All right. There's a point to this. All right. This is how I'm going to explain the difference between a participating public and an objecting public. The modern landfill servicing southern Canadian communities, and like those in North America generally, have a particular relationship with birds. Gulls are certainly the lowly, senseless, and reckless underclass of the modern landfill, or bird buffets, as they're colloquially called. Landfills are a primary food source for the gull. In under 15 minutes at a <coughs> landfill, seagulls are able to satisfy their daily nutritional requirements, and then some. Gulls are also vectors for various diseases, and their excrement uh, can contaminate public water supplies uh, with coliform and other materials. According to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection report, the goal of any landfill is not only to completely prevent gulls from feeding, but also to, quote, eliminate or reduce the suitability and attractiveness of the facility for other gull activities, such as resting, roosting, or loafing. <laughs> now, in my numerous trips to landfills, I spent a lot of time at landfills. I don't witness a lot of gull loafing. <laughs> Indeed, modern southern landfills in Canada and elsewhere have a zero tolerance approach to gulls, which is why they have introduced falcons and hawks to replace the guns, pyrotechnics, propane cannons, balloons, and dogs that used to patrol the landfill landscape. These birds of prey have become part of waste management's big business. And here, um, uh, this is the, just yet another and they shit on the people's houses as they're going to the landfill. So people complain. Waste management responds. Industry's good, responding to our needs. And they now have all of these hawks. And I see spoken with several hawkers whose job is to hang out at landfills day in, day out. And these hawks go around terrorizing the gulls to prevent them from landing on the landfill site. All right. So, um, the birds of prey have become part of this big business. They, according to the hawk handlers I've spoken to, they're allowed to eat any gull that they catch, although this isn't particularly good for the hawks because the gulls carry contaminants through their contact with leachate. So it's bad for the gulls to be eating our trash, it's bad for the hawks to eat the gulls, but there you go, they keep our house rooms clean. Juxtaposed against these trash animals, as uh, Maggie and Johnson uh, talk about in their book, are Iqaluit's ravens. As I stand on Iqaluit's dump, there must be hundreds of these birds casually circling the dump, swooping leisurely to land on fresh piles of discarded food that the steady flow of trucks deposit on the colossal dump. The ravens are not in a hurry to grab the wasted food and fly off, and they take their time. This is in some ways their dump, and no one attempts to scare them off. When I ask why, I'm told that ravens are part of the community. Ravens are the most common birds in northern communities, and they remain in the far north throughout the winter. Uh, they can survive in minus 60 degrees, oh, sorry, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but in minus 60 um, temperatures, it's really cold. According to Inuit creation narratives, raven made the world um, and the waters with the beat of its wing. Very, very famous in what you can see. Very, very famous uh, installation there. In these narratives, ravens possess the ability to transmute, presently it seems, into garbage pickers. Raven the trickster is respected for his resilience, intelligence, and sociability. <coughs> um, raven teaches children how to live in community, and newborn Inuit boys are clothed in raven skin to help them become successful hunters. Ravens follow polar bears and scavenge leftover carcasses, and Inuit mimic the raven's call to attract polar bears in hunting. Ravens also call wolves to dead animals, so they'll make the carcasses more accessible to the birds. They now call humans to dump sites to leave fresh trash. I couldn't resist taking this picture. It's hard to see, but so in a cow with a lot of um, dog sledding, yeah, for hunting, and um, so here, and dogs are uh, are on the landscape 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they're chained up in a line so they don't attack each other. 
and they, they, you know, this is where they live. And then, of course, the ravens who not only eat dog shit, but they, they taunt, they play this catch in these camps. They stand just outside of the range of these poor bloody dogs, and then they taunt them, right? Because they, their ravens are, they, well, they're, I, you can, you know, dog love this story, but ravens, they think they're more intelligent. <laughs> All right. Gulls and ravens may be invoked as metaphors for various human relations, and I know that's where I'm supposed to go. But I want a more material reading here. Neoliberal governance organizes southern waste management. Uh, all, uh, and waste management industries, as I've said, always keen to demonstrate their public responsiveness. Heed community complaints about uh, um, the birds and the excrement. And so, you know, because people don't like the smells and the sounds that the gulls make. So, enlisting hawks to terrorize and kill gulls makes good entrepreneurial sense. The hawks have silenced community complaints. The hawks then become part of the geoengineering, um, as much as uh, waste pickup or recycling. It's because they've become part of the geoengineering architecture that encourages people to forget about waste. Waste is something we don't want to remember or be remembered for, as Peter Van White uh, says. The ravens in Iqaluit operate within, it seems to me, a very different political economy. If Western landfilling depends on a kind of forgetting, then an aboriginal cosmopolitan, as Nigel Clark says, is about remembering. Connecting with the environment, in other words, requires remembering the experiences and sensations of others. Some indigenous cosmology includes in this experience that of non-human animals, as well as uh, the organic and inorganic, weather, climate, mountains and valleys, rivers and lakes, which all make up remembering, which we heard about yesterday. This sense of remembering calls an unknowable future into the present, and remembering in this sense is as much about the future as it is about the past. It's this mode of remembering that provides an account of the Australian Ab Aboriginal way of leaving waste as it's created on the landscape in plain view. These acts across generations strike colonial settlers as the antithesis of civilization, where all waste must be scrupulously moved away from people in their communities as one of civilization's key conditions. And Floyd wrote about this. For Aboriginal peoples, argues Deborah Bird Rose, this casting away from oneself in varying ways, this out of sight, out of mind, amounts to self erasure, the performance of a lie. A refusal to witness and quotes the equivalent of sneaking around the country. Perhaps waste is simply one of a cacophony of pressing issues facing a Calloway, or perhaps waste has become a material signifier of an objecting minority who leave waste in plain sight close to home. As Tester notes, Inuit resistance to the management of birds and mammals by Calumet, um, white man, uh, authorities is a significant consideration in the development of Inuit rights and in the move towards Inuit self-government. The long-standing attempts to import southern waste management practices to Iqaluit is a way of further man managing Inuit <coughs> people, a democratic engagement that's failing. Waste in Canada's north is colonialism, and Inuit practices of leaving waste in plain view is an act of both remembering and objecting to participating in neoliberal democracy. My final one, which is, this is my final case uh, study, which is about an objecting biogeology. Right? It's not just about those little humans. Right. Like waste in a Iqaluit, Canadian mining is a case study in colonialism, varying degrees and times of under and over government involvement, treaty rights, shifting policies and regulations, science and engineering, consulting and, re uh, and research, um, Blah, 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 blah. It goes on, right? Canada is in its fifth uh, century of mining, and industries are regulated by the, quote, free entry system, including the right to explore crown lands. Yes, we've colonized. Uh, which at times has been done in secret. In 2011, Canada remained the top destination for mining exploration, which doesn't include Canada's mining interests in some 100 other countries around the globe. Mining waste constitutes the largest proportion of waste in Canada, which given our municipal solid waste is the largest in the world. One can only imagine what the mining's doing. Approximately two million tons of mining waste is produced in Canada per day, and tends to, and tends to hundreds of millions of tons per single mine's lifetime. Between 95 and 99.9995% of mined ore is considered waste by mining companies. Once extracted, waste rock is typically dumped outside the mine and can spread over several kilometers or miles. 
Tailings are typically put in uh, slurry, composed of water, ground ore, and residual chemicals from mine processing. Various uh, toxic heavy metals, such as nickel, copper, cadmium, arsenic, and selenium, can be leached from mine waste. Uh, oh, and here's a, this is, so we have, no one knows how many abandoned or orphaned, as they call them, um, mines there are in Canada. Here's, this is just in uh, Nunavik. The, all these dots here are uh, abandoned uh, mine sites. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of the scope of what I'm talking about here. The giant mine, uh, located uh, uh, close to Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, is the most well-known of the 27,000-odd uh, abandoned mines. Claims to the giant mine were staked back in 1936, and the mine was brought into full production uh, between 1948 and 2004, producing over 7 million ounces of gold. Mining gold at this site consisted of roasting um, arsenopyrite ore, which pr produces ar arsenic trioxide dust, which is a highly, highly toxic form of arsenic. I'm very lucky to be working with a geologist who studies this and other forms of uh, toxicity uh, in, in mining. So um, it's a long story of what happened to the giant mine. Let's just say that it went through the hands of a number of companies who, who through legal uh, loopholes, was able to abandon it, and now it's the responsibility of the Canadian government, which means the taxpayer. The cleanup is, is suggested to be around a billion dollars, but they're not, they're not quite sure. So, um, so besides the approximately 100 on-site buildings, many of which contain hazardous materials, eight open pits and contaminated soils and waste rock around the mine, there are some 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide dust to remediate. And there's already been a number of deaths. Of course, it, it's, this is a course. Of course, you already know that this, is, this was built, of course, near a, a, an indigenous community, and so the people are most likely Geoengineering, the techno fix, right? Now, this is a coffee table book, which is a um, uh, hole in the ground. It's uh, produced by industry, and it's a beautiful um, coffee table book of, uh, you know, a thousand and one things you can do with an abandoned mine. I, I kid you not. After considering some 56 <laughs> methods of take it out versus leave it in technologies, industry and government now favor the frozen block method. This is by no means an immediate solution, as it will take some 20 years to complete in various stages. The frozen block method, and I won't go through it, it's just to say that um, this, this is, you know, you can look at this online. This is, uh, you know, the arsenic trioxide here, they, they pump down, uh, they, they put these uh, rods down here, and then the basic idea is to freeze all the soil and rock, etc., uh, around it, and then keeping the arsenic trioxide in place. That's, that's, that's the idea. Okay. Um, the frozen block method is being used in several mines in Canada, whereby sorry, the mining waste, uh, which is of course got lots of arsenic and other dangerous elements, is frozen in perpetuity with the hope that a future generation will safely resolve this ongoing waste issue. And this is how it is discussed in all government documents. This infinite time frame is alarming local residents. And the lengthy stages of the environmental assessment are by no means concluded. I've been trying to track this. I've counted to, so far, I've already counted since I've been here, 664 documents relating to the giant mine waste remediation assessment. Protesters of the frozen block method argue it amounts to uh, nothing more uh, than another interim solution, like nuclear waste, because it projects a final solution onto a future generation. In perpetuity, can't factor in the effects of, for instance, climate change or biodiversity loss or biodiversity abundance, which I could talk about in a second. It can't predict, prevent, or remediate ecological disasters resulting from massive flooding, permafrost melting, or earthquakes. In the here and now, most mining infrastructure uh, has been designed assuming no change in the climate and only limited adapt adaptation to climate change plans are underway. Climate change is low on the list of priorities for mining operators because mines have a relatively short lifespan and won't be operating when the more severe effects of uh, climate, change, climate change manifest themselves in Canada. And planning for post-operational and closure stages requires a significant economic, organizational, and political commitment to the future, one that mining companies are not keen to engage in because of the 
cost. Nor does in perpetuity take political affiliations and priorities into the future, uh, account in the future. Will the Canadian government, assuming that there still is one, prioritize the Rosa Block method to the tune of some $1.5 million annually in perpetuity? Or might there be other environmental issues that press upon the government's attention? I'm going to guess. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I know this is really long. You don't have to read it. Hedging their bets, Gottswag, which is one of the many industries, their special note regarding forward-looking statements, and it's on their website, uh, and in their press releases, announcing their contract award to clean up snow lakes, um, our saddle pyrite waste, reads this. So these are the forward-looking statements, right? Believe, expect, anticipate, contemplate, target, plan, intend, blah, blah, blah. And then they say, Forward-looking statements are necessarily based on a number of estimates and assumptions that, while considered reasonable by the company, are inherently subject to significant business, economic, competitive, political, and social uncertainties and contingencies. Nothing to say anything about the material, of course. Many factors could, uh, could cause the company's actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied in any forward-looking statements made by on, or on behalf of the company. Yeah, I find this, I couldn't write this about my lecturing. You know, I couldn't get away with this, right? All right, while acknowledging the speculative nature of forward-looking statements with regard to profits, little is said about the significant material uncertainties here. These uncertainties relate not only to the amount and severity of waste, um, contaminated or not, produced, but to interacting geological thresholds. These thresholds speak to an objecting and creative biogeology that interacts with complex thresholds. To take one example, global warming is melting the permafrost that was meant to keep mining waste frozen in our north, and upon which the frozen block method technology is partially based. Buried mining waste, not waiting inertly for future generations, is involved, and this involvement is contra latour, distinctly undemocratic. Waste is not a public whose participation may be circumscribed by geoengineering and political fiat. All right, conclusions. I couldn't resist, I just think. This is what they should put on the golden spike, I think. Waste brings into sharp resolution the interplay between geological processes stretching through deep time and humanity's short run but significant activity. Municipal solid waste, mining, and myriad other forms of waste constitute terminal capitalism's profound fallout, as Keeling and Sandoz write, underwritten by ideologies of development and modernization. Recent calls for and mobilizations of participatory and consensus-building publics, and even the possibility of an objecting public, take place within the shadow of terminal capitalism. Unlike climate change and biodiversity loss, understandably high on the list of uh, concerns. Waste is not yet an anthropocentric figure, despite the close relationship between these matters of acknowledged concern and waste management's destratification of resources that require the use of immense tracts of land, the destruction of habitats, contamination, and the colossal use of fossil fuels. Discussions of the Anthropocene emphasize the bequeathing of environmental risk thresholds and crises to future generations, including the apocalyptic foreclosure of future generations themselves. Landfilled mining, openly dumped, and other forms of waste and their environmental contamination are bequeathed from previous generations. Gifts of leaking and spilling, spilling leachate, abandoned mines, arsenic trioxide tailings, and so on. Experts estimate the longevity of contemporary landfills in terms of less than 100 years. Mining waste remediation doesn't even carry this anticipatory promise, as landfilling and nuclear waste repositories do. This dubious inheritance assumes a particularly troubling hue when we consider neo-colonial inheritance in Canada's north. Through landfilling and technology such as the frozen block method, we are recomposing disturbed strata with different ingredients. And with the increasing use of abandoned mines as landfills, as well as mining of landfills for reprocessing materials, this is how desperate we are, different waste forms are merging in complex and unpredictable ways. And yet, unlike climate change modeling, we've got little idea of waste biogeological thresholds, not just in terms of sheer volume, but in terms of the heterogeneous mix of, uh, of unknown unknowns that bacteria metabolize into new entities 
or what landslides, avalanches, earthquakes, floods, and melting permafrost will make <coughs> of re-stratified mining, landfill, and nuclear waste. We're all talking about biodiversity loss. When we talk about waste, we're talking about biodiversity abundance. And we have no idea what these aerobic, anaerobic, and other microorganisms are doing. They are creating new entities. And unlike climate change mitigation, where technologies are the subject of debate, with, where they've not yet been settled, there has long been a political sedimentation of waste management technologies. Waste management technologies encourage more waste, further expansion, further de- and restratification, and further landscape transformation. These technologies, as Melinda Cooper argues, may themselves be indistinguishable from the thing that we're trying to solve. That is to say, equally unpredictable, incalculable, and term uh, turbulent in its unfolding. Again, Beck said this back in 96, right? Geoengineering further solidifies publics to consensus building and democratic deliberation subtended by corporate and government interests and largely substantiates standards of participating public. Objecting to waste management uh, must therefore resemble something quite different. Perhaps the kind of waste pra practices very visible in Iqaluit and other norm norm uh, northern communities. There's an understanding in these communities born of a starkly different environmental cosmology that biogeology participates in and objects to and is created with human practices to wit, the Kaluwitz municipal government is now engaged in yet another sustainability exercise. Before I came here, they rejected the landfill. Now they want incineration. So here we go again. Involving earnest <coughs> government representatives who are collaborating with waste ma management industry in yet another attempt to modernize Iqaluit's waste management structures and practices. So far, though, it's met with little success. The open dump receives round-the-clock deposits, waste is left on the landscape, and the ravens have free reign. Thank you. Maybe um, why? Do we think that? And the second 
just to turn it, suggest for me at least how weird this whole thing gets is the second kind of question, which is the very end when you said that so the moral I think the moral thrust is, oh my Oh, really? I'm so quiet. Yeah, I'm sorry. Interview. For other people, too. Okay. Uh, I think the moral underlying, which we see a lot, is like, oh my God, do we see what we're doing? A, humans are kudzu, so we're wrapping the planet one way, and then we're producing the toxic surroundings that will contain us. Bad, 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 bad. Like, fear, 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 fear. But at the very end, you said something that I think is really kind of right, which is, we don't know what these things are spawning. And part of me thinks, yeah, that's cool. It's spawning all kinds of new entities. Now, these new entities probably will not allow us to exist. But why aren't we just, OK, so what? We won't exist. Why aren't we interested in those new entities? I mean, you see what I'm saying? That would be the objecting public. Is The objecting public is saying, actually, you're right. We're spawning things that will do away with you, and that's our objection. I'm not sure how to say it more clearly, other than say for me the animist is not just the to not just the indigenous people. The animist is also the autistic person who we give a negative diagnosis to, but it's very interesting as far as like I don't care about humans. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. that's the objecting yeah. that's the more robust objection. Yeah, let me start with that. That's the second one. Because it's probably easier for me. <laughs> You know, in a lot of my work, I talk about the indifference of, you know, of, of, of you know, almost everything here that's not humans, right? It's completely indifferent. I mean, bacteria are largely indifferent to, to humans. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll play with us in our guts and stuff. But they, you know, they, and, you know, they, 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 they are the biosphere, you know, not animals. Um, so, it seems, you know, this, the objecting, the, my worry with Stanger's thing is that, that the, you know, she, in this article that she wrote, you know, if for her, well, maybe it's not, but in this article anyway, she talks, it's solely in terms of the human. Yeah. So, the reason I kind of got objecting slash creative is because it seems to me that, you know, the planet is, of course, highly, highly creative. It's highly, you know, Highly volatile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a lot of stasis, a lot of change over these time, a lot more change. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's very creative. Now, I don't think it's the case to say that why aren't we interested in these new entities? Because there are multitudes of scientists and engineers on this planet who are extremely interested and very, very nervous about these new entities. Um, they talk about them in terms of contaminants of emer emerging concern. I just was actually talking to some scientists who are up in the north, and they think that they have discovered something that's worse than PCBs, which I didn't think was possible, by final PCB, which is the worst. And now they think, crap, we found something else which looks like it's even more toxic, and it proliferates the northern landscape. So it's not that people aren't interested. People are extraordinarily interested. I think it's that this is something, if this is not the tourist democracy where everyone, you know, is at some kind of Knights of the Round Table and we're all sitting equally, if this is not an equal playing field, right, that these, the, these entities, etc., this volatile planet, it has many more seats at the table than us vulnerable humans. So I don't, I, I don't see I don't any kind of democracy. I mean, if they are concerned because. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. The relationship with us versus yeah. us actually becoming somewhat neutral and saying, oh, we're taking a kind of, well, PCPs, worse than PCPs, well, that's terrible for us and terrible for a lot of things, but it's not terrible for the worst thing of the Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, Rebecca mentioned that I, I worked with uh, yeah. Lynn Margulis for a year, you know, and she's famous for a number of things, but, you know, she said, guy is a tough bitch. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and, and the scientists in the in her laboratory, the, the real sense I got over you know many lunches and coffees and drinks was, for them like the faster humans become extinct, the better for the planet. And let's you know, and then the, you know some really interesting things can happen. You know, so it's, it, I, 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 I mean, you know, I think people are concerned about people. You know, humans. You know, so 
I think, you know, if we're concerned about humans, then we should really pay attention to waste as, a, as the signature of the Anthropocene. Um, but, you know, oh yeah, because it's not like the planet is going to, I mean, the planet will, of course, um, in, you know, be destroyed uh, by sun eventually in a few <laughs> years. I mean, that's, that's obviously going to happen. But, you know, for, the hum for human existence, we, we obviously are concerned about our own survival, whether, you know, for, for better or worse. Your earlier one is harder for me to answer, so I need to think about it a little bit more. But Ma, I'll take a kind of um, a crude stab at it, which is, I you know, I, I'm not sure I can locate like the, the sort of speech thing with humans at all. Um, but I tend to work with scientists who firmly know that the microorganisms and rocks and whatever it is um, speak. We're just so ignorant, we find it difficult to understand their language. But, you know, so it's all about understanding their languages. You know, when you do, they're, they're certainly speaking all the time. Sorry, it's just a text, so I just like, they're semiotic, but they're not low there. But it doesn't matter. It's oh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I would disagree with that. I know. I, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't, I just can't go I don't extend human speech onto other things I love them to. But it doesn't. Yeah, I love what you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I love what you do. Hi, thank you so much. Boy, I'm so in the right place as a feminist geologist. It's incredibly exciting to me. Um, and so, I actually, what I was going to comment on or ask about relates to the question, the second question. Um, I wonder, well, let me just say that the rocks of the Canadian Shield are, you know, the elders of the planet, right? I'm sure you know from working with geologists that, you know, they're the oldest, some of the oldest rocks on Earth. And they, I think, themselves, I think the rocks are objecting. I wouldn't say that the toxic dump is objecting, but the rocks are objecting. Uh, you know, the rocks have agency there because the only, the reason, I mean, I, I, I think it's certainly true that, like, I don't, I don't pay for garbage collection, you know, I, I, I resist recycling because I, I think it's, 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 it's wrong. It, but anyhow, so, um, I mean, I like to do sort of, you know, gorilla garbage disposal. I, I practice that. Um, I strategically distribute my garbage at my institution where I teach, at Vassar College, you know, um, various places. I like to do that. And sometimes I have chickens and they help with my garbage and all that. But, I mean, I think it's true that it is, you know, the, the, the um, Native people who, you know, they have no alternative but to dump their garbage there. But, um... Damn this thing. Okay. Oh, it's working. Okay. Um, but but the earth itself there is objecting because there's nothing in which I mean you talk about stratification, but there's nothing you can dig into there. I mean there are abandoned mines, and you can pursue this like ridiculous notion of freezing and isolating this material in holes that we've already dug. But to dig a hole for um, disposal for landfills, you just can't do it in that kind of rock. It's you know. It's um, billions of years old. It's the hardest rock on Earth because it's lived so long, because it's been through so many cycles, and it is firmly objecting. It's saying, you know, you can't dispose of your waste in me because you cannot freaking dig a hole in me, you know, and be so easily and dump your shit. So I think that I think that the rocks have agency there, and that they are objecting. Um, I mean, I could go on, but I won't, so, but thank you. I mean, I just love this whole thing. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, I, I well, obviously, you know, I agree with what you're saying. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't know whether we want to pick up on this whole thing about recycling and the good citizen and all of this, because it really is part of the neoliberal governmentality. It is this par excellence. The more we take responsibility individually for the coffee cup, et cetera, et cetera. The la well, A, it's numerous studies show the more we waste. The more we recycle, the more we waste, right? So when we recycle, we think, oh, it's being recycled, so it's okay for me to waste more. So we consume more, we waste more when we recycle. Most of it ends up in landfills anyway, or incineration, which 
depending is worse, etc., etc. Don't even get me started on energy from waste. <laughs> and we divert ourselves from, you know, like, um, you know, what the speaker was saying, so my mind's gone blank. You know, the, the students coming in and saying, should I commit suicide so I'll have, you know, I have students coming in all the time tell, wanting me to tell them how to recycle better. Like, how do I do this more? How do I, re how do I get my roommates to recycle? Because I do, but they don't. <coughs> and I can't engage in any of those conversations because this is all downstream, end of pipe. Let's focus on the individual. Oh, look, we can plant flowers. Oh, look, we can do this. Oh, look, we can, you know, walk to the garbage dump. Blah, 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 blah. These are all total downstream, which deflects our attention. The opiate of the masses deflects our attention from big industry and government, which has, in Canada, almost no power, and the big upstream questions. Like, why are we over-consuming so much? Well, there's you no know? such thing as waste. I mean, the world yeah. is running out of itself, but there's no such thing as waste. And there are also great religious traditions which tell us there's no such thing as waste. And if we could just, you know, accept that and move forward, nobody would be able to capitalize, literally, on the fact that we have this concept of waste. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. But I know that's unpopular. It's super unpopular to say <laughs> stop recycling and yeah. stop trying to oh, change your light bulbs and you know, blah, 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 right? Because we've all taken this on as good citizens, and we're doing this, and we fret over all of this stuff, right? Meanwhile, big industry, right? Sorry, I was going to plan. Sorry. I've just come off teaching three courses, and I'm still in that mode, you know. Any story. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I'm not a very good feminist. <laughs> would you have anything to say about your work on waste and the kinds of ethical issues that you're raising in relation to feminism? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I, I've written a bit on uh, what I call an ethic of vulnerability. But it seems to me, as I mentioned before, you know, the planet's largely indifferent. You know, I'm using by the planet. I use the you know, organic, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think it's, it's largely different. Humans don't have that option. We are intensely vulnerable. Now, of course, as we know, the Enlightenment answer to that is dominate, dominate, dominate. And look where we are. So that clearly doesn't work. So it seems to me we need something entirely different. And I draw my inspiration from Peter Van White's work with the NA community in Northern Canada, who uh, he wrote a brilliant book, The Highway of the Atom, Compulsory reading for my prime minister, not every head of state in the uh, world. And, um, you know, this was about 10, well, we've been out there for uh, 20 plus years working within, within a community who mined uh, the, the uh, uranium that was transported on the highway of the atom eventually um, to Nevada, where it was put in um, uh, Bad Boy and and detonated on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So in the late 1990s, the Diné community, who didn't know what they were mining, who have suffered ever since from higher rates of cancer, suicide rates, um, staggering unemployment, depression, you name it, 
fundraised and sent a delegation at Dene over to Japan to publicly apologize for the part they had in the bombs dropped in Japan. Now this to me is entirely different ethics than the kind of ethic I was raised with in neoliberal um, capitalist Canada, where you would take responsibility for nothing. You do risk assessments and try and take as little responsibility as possible. I think we're in a situation where since you know, since we've evolved into what we call human, we have uh, gifted to our future generations all kinds of crap. So we come on, we you know, we come into our lives already um, implicated and 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 imbued with all kinds of stuff, and we bequeath future generations more. So my ethics, the one that I want to develop, has it's starts there with, with what we have been gifted, <laughs> to use Diffros' term, how violent, the, the violence of that gifting, and the violence of the gifting that we project into the, you know, it, it, to our future generations, however many there are left. And we, that ethics must be one of taking um, much more responsibility, a crazy amount of responsibility, the mother load of responsibility as the Dene. You know, responsibility for things we don't even know we've done, for things we don't even experience as harm. Like mining, I mean, look, I mean, I'm so implicated. Look how stupid metal I'm wearing. I'm so implicated in mining. I don't know where this came from. I don't know how many people died and how many children have cancer from this stupid little that I'm wearing, right? I'm implicated, and that's where the ethics has to start, of a mega responsibility, like a crazy amount of responsibility. Not, it's the, which is the exact opposite of industry's minimal responsibility, if anything at all. I don't know. Mm. Oh, we've given, given up on the microphone? Yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as you as you mentioned <laughs> as you mentioned earlier, Myra, uh, the future of Canadian uh, resource extraction is going to take place in the north, mm -hmm. but it's going to take place not further north than Yellowknife or Kelly. Um and it's going to, for instance, as you probably know, Baffin Island is going to be the home of a new gold mining initiative by an Australian-led consortium. It's going to be massive. It's going to build a railroad across the Caribou Monument. Anyways, um, so my question is, can you imagine, can we imagine an abject public being mobilized in places where these masses, you know, waste dumps are going to be created, but nowhere near an urban population? Yeah, well, I think that already happens in the North. I mean, I, yeah. you know, we, we, we know that, you know, Inuit and other indigenous communities have been objecting for years and years are also, it's, it's, but it's so much more complicated than that, right? Because they're also co-implicated in, you know, so, you know, it, it's one of those perfect storms where all, you know, as you say, you know, all of this is going to happen in the Great White Norm where there will be few witnesses. You know, as Peter Van Wyke says, you know, how do you bear witness to something you don't experience, right? And, and this is what it's going to require, right? It's going to require bearing witness to something that none of us will actually experience, or, or few people will do. But, you know, we're, you know which, which is already happening. I mean, in, the sum, in, in that sense, you know, there's no difference between the door and so many other people that's already taking place, right? Where we, where, you know, we, we don't wear, bear witness to the, to the massive, you know, slum <coughs> around the world. You know, we, you know, we, we can't do that. In places that are highly populated with humans. So, you know, it's, it's. So, in the interest of neoliberal oh, time. <laughs> <laughs>
dance uh, of, of the material teachers that we're building is a kind of blind spot. Yeah, so that's why it's an ethic of vulnerability for me. Because this makes it, a, 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 you know, this is not just an epistemological vulnerability, it's an ontological mm -hmm. one, right? Yeah. Like this is our being. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, sorry, that, sorry, that was kind of curious. Um, <laughs> Beer, I could probably grasp a lot more, but um, but that I mean that's my quick answer is yeah, which is why it's vulnerability and not anything else. Thank you very much. And we'll be